Alrighty guys and gals, so here we go again, straight out of bed this morning and um, I've got this dialogue which is in consideration of this, this series of monologues called A Course in Mastery and this chapter in particular is chapter 3. I said it was chapter four in one of the other videos, but it's chapter three, and it's talking about forgiveness. And the book is depicted and delivered as if Jesus is speaking about it directly. And so I've already gone through the considerations that I have in relation to that, but there's so much to this stuff. And what I'm saying about critical thinking is along the lines of this because there's so much more than the superficial message that we can listen to or we can read. There really is just uh, an enormous amount of, of information that we can derive out of any dialogue or, or story or depiction of history, whatever. And so I'm going to be speaking about a few more facets of it. In this dialogue, Jesus is saying that it is very beneficial to the individual not to judge and to forgive. And the reason why this is beneficial is because it alleviates the energy which pertains to this judgment or the forgiveness because it releases you and so if somebody does something to you it doesn't matter how much of an atrocity it is if you constantly think about that then it generates various negative emotions and if we don't get a resolve on that, then they will stay with us for eternity. And this is the whole thing about Freudian regression, you see. If somebody has had something happen to them in their past and they've repressed it, then the issues haven't been dealt with. The negative energy pertaining to those issues still remains unless we can get a resolve. How do we get a resolve? We go back and we forgive. We, we see that the whole act of forgiveness is letting go. Letting go of the animosity, the, the, the anger, the pain, the fear, any of these emotions that are gonna cause us to dwell. And when we dwell, on these negative emotions, the physiology creates free radicals, basically. Harmful cells that attack the body. But not only that, the negative thoughts poison the mind. They prevent you from having a clear, beautiful, blissful mind. Because always going on at some level there is this energy which cannot forgive, holds deep resentment and anger, and all this sort of thing. And so, whether it's forgiveness, letting go, just forget about it. Okay, forget about it. Whatever. I can't carry the weight of that. Because if I do, it's a detriment to myself. So what am I doing? I used to have a dialogue with my sister about our stepmother and she said she will never forgive that bitch. And every time the stepmother is mentioned or whether the stepmother springs to mind or her childhood is in debate, then the stepmother is a major issue and you can see the, the, the deep anger and resentment within her. And I've said to her many occasions, you've got to let it go. I will never forgive that bitch. You're not forgiving that bitch. 
You're letting it go. You are emancipating yourself. I said, sure, don't ever forgive the bitch for what she did to you. She traumatised you. But let go of the negative emotion that you want to project onto her because it's not, it's not reaching her. Unless you're in the vicinity of her and you tell her what a bit she was, then forget about it. And if that's going to help, then go to her one day and tell her what a bit she was. And does she now realise the extent of the damage she was doing to that young kid? Get some sort of resolve on it. Make, it, make you feel better. OK, well, I've done that. I've told her now. Then let it go. Because if you don't let it go, it will eat you for the rest of your life. And so this is the whole thing about forgiveness then. And the other thing is judgment. If you're going to be judging people, I judge you because of this and I judge you because of that. Okay, like I said in another video, judge them. Sure, judge them. Let them know you have judged them. Tell other people. Bring the police into it. Bring the courts into it. Let society judge them. Finally, punish them and then free yourself, knowing that they've got their just desserts. I feel more happy now that that person has been punished. Forget about it. And so this is the premise in this book, of course, on mastery. It's from a personal perspective. Now, this is the, the whole crux of what I'm going to be speaking about now. It's because all the information that uh, we can glean and gather in our lives is dependent on perspective. Whether we read something, whether we watch something, whether we hear something, whether we think something, there's a perspective. And so if one person tells you about um, the abusive stepfather or abusive father or whatever, and then you can go, that's really cruel, cool. he's a bastard, that guy. But then if you listen to the mother, well, the mother will say, look, your friend, the daughter, sh she is a real handful and she's a liar. She creates stories because she always wants to be the victim. There's something about her that just wants to relish in being the victim. So she creates scenarios. You see? And so that's perspective, isn't it? And so then if you listen to the mother and you listen to the, the, the daughter, you've got two perspectives and you think, well, how many more perspectives are there? What do all the people that know this situation have to say about it? And then all of a sudden it gets cloudy, doesn't it? Who's going to find the truth? Probably the person that's going to find the truth is going to be a shrink. You know, a psychoanalyst that's going to be looking to see, really, where the issue lies, where it derives from, what brought it about, what brings it about, why is there an, a need for it, why does this person perpetuate scenarios like this. We all know people that just revel in the victim, they're always a victim. Because they always want sympathy, they always want feeling sorry for, and they always want to exercise a little bit of energy over somebody so they can get favours and this, that and the other. And so there's, there's many things to take into consideration. But this course in mastery, from what I've read so far, four chapters, is good. But it comes from the subjective experience only. It doesn't take into consideration the ramifications of you not judging or the ramifications of you not forgiving to society. For instance, if we shouldn't judge and say your next door neighbour rapes you and you are under the, you're under the indoctrination that judging is bad and you feel guilty if you judge because Jesus says you shouldn't judge and you're a Christian so you're not going to judge so therefore you don't tell anybody about this person raping you because you don't want to stand in a court and um, you know judge this person and have a judge judge that person because judging is wrong so you've been told and so you don't mention it and then a couple of weeks later this guy rapes somebody else on the same street and devastates their life, traumatises them 
and causes all sorts of issues, long-term issues in their life. And then, what do you do? Because you never judged. Is it not that you were partially responsible for that rape? Of course you were. Because had you judged, had you said what you did was wrong, I'm going to the authorities, the authorities will arrest this person, probably imprison them, um, if it was a very serious um, crime, such as rape, and they'd be on um, remand, and so they'd be taken off the streets, and so the second rape would never have occurred. And so, what this book failed to speak about, and this is the issue I took with it, was the ramifications of not judging. Because we have a societal obligation to judge. And this is why we have judges. Because there needs to be order. And if somebody perpetrates a crime, then they need to be held responsible. And they need to be judged, they need to be assessed, they need to be evaluated. And if found guilty, they need to be punished. As a measure of prevention to stop other people's suffering. You see, if none of us judge, and we don't report the things that people are doing wrong to society, then these people will continue to do it with impunity. And so this is the issue I took with it. It's a moral issue. And this is why this non-judgmental thing is a fantasy as far as I'm concerned. And it's a very, very selfish thing because it only pertains to you. Because if you don't judge, if you forget about it, okay, I'm just whitewashing that, um, I'm not having it a part of my life, I don't want to mention it to anybody else because there will be a constant reminder of oh, there's that bastard that raped you and uh, the court case will take two years and maybe it'll get publicity and I don't want people looking at me, I'm going to feel shame and all these sort of things. And so you say, I'm not judging. And then if everybody was of that state of mind, then the person could break with impunity, couldn't they? And this goes across the board with the whole thing. So therefore then, this non-judgmental attitude can't be a reality within a society. It can only be a reality in a selfish individual. If you just want to forget about it, sever it and continue with your life. That's how you deal with it. You don't want um, anybody to be talking about it, debating it, or, or, or looking into it. You don't want anybody to be questioning you, to be questioning your integrity. How did the rape come about? What actually happened? Were you partially to blame? You know, were you doing this? Were you doing that? Were you provocative? All this sort of thing, you see. And so what happens is, when you're of the opinion that you shouldn't judge, the last thing you want to do is go and be judged by other people, isn't it? Because in a scenario like a rape case, you're going to get judged and you're going to get judged very profoundly because this is the nature. It's all about character in a rape case, unfortunately. You can be raped by somebody, but then they'll say, yeah, but you know, aren't you kind of like, you're a prostitute, aren't you? And so, I mean, why do you feel so strong about rape? I mean, are you sure it was rape or are you just using um, the, the power of the courts to have um, jurisdiction over this person because you've got some sort of uh, grievance against them? I mean, you're so free with sex. You do it for money. You do it with anybody. And so, you know, is it really that much of a big deal? Whereas if there was a sweet young girl and, um, you know, she maybe was a virgin or she just had one boyfriend for so many years, then the character issue is very different, isn't it? And so, one would be getting judged far greater than the other one. And so, this whole judgment then, you see what a can of worms it pertains to. And so, in this book where Jesus is speaking, whenever Jesus is speaking about things like this, he's speaking, as I've said in one of the videos, from another dimension. He's speaking from the dimension that you are eternal awareness. Your spirit having an experience in this world, in this body. And it's kind of like that nobody else comes into the equation. 
It's just you. The effect judging will have on you. The effect that forgiveness will have on you. Selfish. Alleviating you. Doing everything you can to protect you. Regardless of the ramifications of not speaking out to protect society. And so they don't mention anything like that in this book. They don't say, well, I mean, in certain scenarios, it is necessary to judge. Because you, we have to protect one another. Because if we don't alert our fellow humans to a bad apple in the barrel, then the barrel in its entirety will be contaminated at some stage. So somebody has to take that bad apple out. And so that's one facet of it. The other thing is, the Old Testament has this God, which is deemed by many scholars these days to be the false God, to be the demiurge. Of course, he's selfish, he's obnoxious, he's all-powerful and all-knowing, and yet he's so riddled with envy and jealousy and self-righteousness and intolerance and he's got all sorts of perversions whereby he wants his beloved children to kill their children for the love of him and allow their wives and daughters to be raped by entities i.e. the Nephilim in the Bible Job, if anybody knows that chapter and so you can see that this God, who's supposed to love his children, is, is completely ridiculous. Any rational mind applying itself to the Old Testament will, will just conclude that it's, it's such a contradiction. And so, one of the main facets of the Old Testament is an eye for an eye. God judges all the time. That's what he's doing. He's judging the, the Jews on a constant basis. And when they don't follow um, his desires, then he says in scenarios like this, all stand in a line. The man on the right, take out your sword and stick it into the neck of the man on your left. And on this day, 2,772 people were, were, were slain. What sort of a God's that that loved his children, preposterous. So therefore then, if we take on board then that this book is designed to confuse us, is designed to mislead us, is a complete obverse of any semblance of truth. Because when you look in the Bible and you see Lucifer, the, the light bearer, giving light to man, well, isn't that a good thing? Light, knowledge, wisdom, thinking for themselves, Rather than just being told what to do, you can't eat from that apple tree. And then Satan, the serpent, if you eat from this apple, you too will become like gods and you will know right from wrong. That sounds good. What's wrong with that? In relation to all the, the stuff that Jehovah was saying, it seems perfectly reasonable. And I know which camp I'd be in if I was in the Garden of Eden. And so then, when you look at judging in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye, you can see that that was so prolific. And if we are of the inner standing that Jehovah was in actual fact the demiurge, he was a liar, he was a deceiver, so we can't believe anything that he's supposed to have said. And so if he says that if a man takes your eye, then you take his eye. Well, I think we, we, we have to consider that that is wrong. Because how can a bad apple do good deeds? All of the stuff that he was doing in the Bible was wrong. And so how can that then be right? How can we take that on board as wisdom and a stance in righteousness? We can't, we have to question it greatly. We have to look at the whole book and we go, well, it's all wrong to me. So why would we want to take that bit out of it? 
and have that as a guidance to the way in which we live our lives. So from this standpoint, judging is an evil. And so you can see then that this whole world has courts of law with judges in them and they get you to swear on this pack of lies and this disgusting depiction of jealousy and hate. And so wouldn't it be reasonable to assume then that again we're being misguided? We're being steered so far away from the real God, which is ourselves, of course, as Jesus said on numerous occasions. And so then you can see that the world is under the jurisdiction of the Demiurge. How did it come to be when the book is so rational, so illogical, so painful to read, and yet, because people are told that it's a good book, and it's God and he loves you so many times, then people just, they, they, they lose the facility to be able to assess for themselves, but he's ordering his loved ones to kill their sons, and his loved ones to give his daughters to aliens, and to take your sword out and to stick it in the neck, and so many other things. That, surely that's not a, a benevolent God. That's not a God I want to follow. He sounds a very scary God, I'd be petrified. And he insists that you should be afraid of him. Why? Because he'd kill you if you don't follow all of his abominations of what we're supposed to adhere to. So you look at the world and you go, oh, okay, where do we go from here? For thousands of years, we've had judges and they've been getting us to swear on this Bible, which is so far from any semblance of goodness, it's untrue. And yet everybody's under the indoctrination of it. How did it happen? I, I, I pulled my hair out. How did it happen? You can say that people have been indoctrinated, it's not their fault, and, and this, that, and the other. Well, I just, I can't see it like that. I just see there's a lack of critical thinking. There's a lack of desire to want to think for oneself. People, they're, they're predominantly lazy. They don't want to look for truth themselves. They just want to be told it. And then they just want to get on with whatever they're doing. Easy life. And this is why they just give free reign to politicians. Oh, you do it. I can't be bothered to look into all this law and uh, read all these papers and this stuff. Like, that's boring. And so when they do that then, what are they doing? They're giving away their life, their freedom of choice and many other things. And so this is why we're in the state we're in. And so if you ask me, Aaron, do you think judging is good? Well, I can give you so many variations of opinion on that, can't I? Depending from what standpoint I'm observing it from. If I'm in this society, as it is, governed by the law of the Bible, with judges, that's how it is. And so, if somebody perpetrates a crime, then you follow the protocol. You go, Mr. Policeman, that person's done such and such, I will bear witness in your court of law and I will put my hand on that Bible and I will swear to the almighty God that I'm going to tell the truth and the whole truth, so help me God. That's what happens in this society, that's how it's set up. But if you don't want to adhere to that and you say, I'm not getting involved in that because I know that that book is lies, it's devious and it's evil and there is a negative energy in relation to it, the Demiurge. I don't want anything to do with that and I don't want anything to do with the eye for an eye system. Because what does that do? It generates negative energy, doesn't it? 
There's no avoiding that. With all the promoting of terror and evil that's going on in the world, this is what this system wants from us. It wants our negative energy. And it wants us to drip feed it on a constant basis. And so this is why we get one terrorism attack one week and then two weeks later we get another one and then we get another one and then we get a bit of a war and then we get a potential threat of whomever, China, North Korea, Iran and on and on and on. Just to keep drip feeding our negative energy, which this negative God demands, always has demanded it. So when you look at society from that perspective, you can say, well, it's all wrong. And so when you look at this book then, supposedly written, stated by Jesus, you can say, well, okay, that seems good. It seems good from the individual perspective, but it doesn't work in this world for the reasons I've just stated. And so there's a dichotomy there, isn't there? Either you want to be completely loving for your own survival and your own benefit at the cost, potentially, of your fellow man because you're all about the self, self-preservation and basking in the love and basking in the light of Jesus. Where is Jesus? Well, is Jesus up there somewhere? Is he all around? Is he in us somewhere? The, the Christos? It, what, what are we dealing with when we are following Jesus and the morals and the teachings of Jesus? He came apparently from another world, another dimension. He was here briefly and he's gone back to that other dimension. And so would it not be fair to say then that he is speaking to us from another dimension about how to get a resolve on our equanimity and he didn't have a grasp of the human being and he did, most definitely wouldn't be able to comprehend the magnitude of change which has come about now in the world and yet apparently he's still preaching the same words he was preaching 2,000 years ago when people were just wearing sandals and rags and milling around in the desert. So does that wisdom carry forward? Can we reasonably be expected to carry that wisdom forward? I don't think we can. Because as I've said, that wisdom pertains to spirit. It pertains to the protection of the higher self. And what it's saying is, don't get involved in that out there because it's illusion. If you get involved in that out there and you take it seriously, then you're not going to have a good experience in this dimension. And I can say this to you because I know that you are only having an illusory experience. You see, that's the only way you can accept these words of Jesus, to forgive and not to judge, is if knowing that it doesn't matter about your fellow man, whether the rapist goes free to rape and rape and rape and rape, because it's only an illusory anyway. We just think momentarily that it's a reality. And within a flick of our fingers, we're going to be back somewhere else. We're going to go, oh, I wish I knew that before. It would have saved me all that stress and all that emotion that was being pulled from one side of the place to the next, to the next, to the next, because I considered it to be so real. And so that's the distinction as far as I can gather. And this is why everything gets so incredibly confusing 
because there's so many perspectives to view any given scenario from. And because we all have one, a perspective, and we all have various programming and cultural indoctrinations, then we're all looking at everything differently, aren't we? And so there isn't one format for the human race because the human race is so diverse. Culturally, we're so diverse. Intellectually, we're so diverse. All the programs and the teachings that we've had, we're so diverse. I've been talking about Islam uh, a little bit in recent times. Look at their cultural differences and how they're coming into the Western world and what's happening? Complete chaos. It's not right. It shouldn't really be happening. The assimilation of cultures should happen very gradually. And it should happen when people have decided for themselves that they want to live a certain life in a certain culture. And they want to leave a certain life and culture behind. Because they consider that the culture that they're going to gives them more opportunity and can provide better standards of living. And so it would be fair to assume then that people coming from other cultures which are steeped in a particular dogma and religion they should leave that behind. And there should be a prerequisite that when you come into a Christian, a Christian culture, then isn't it respectful to adopt their religion? After all, this is what Islam demands from everybody that they adopt theirs. And if you don't, then you suffer the ramifications ultimately. And so, it's all a mishmash. It's all a perversion of perspectives. And you look at it, and people looking for truth. And as I've said, whose truth? What truth? How's it possible? And so the video I made finally, the one before this, last night, was, Having looked at all this stuff like I do, I've come to a certain resolve. And the resolve is that, well, we seem to have chosen to come here for an experience. And we've got embroiled in a negative energy system. Did we know that before we opted to go, I'll go down to Earth? Yeah, but it's run by the Demiurge, you know, he's a complete bastard. And it's all about manipulation, domination and fear-mongering. Ah, okay, I'm going to see if I can crack that nut when I'm down there. It'd be a good challenge. Oh, it's a good challenge, all right. And so, for those of us, those of you, that are on the precipice of cracking this nut, then what have we derived? The thing I've derived is that there's pleasure to be had from this dimension and there's suffering, just like the Buddha two and a half thousand years ago. That's what he concluded. And you can't stop that locomotive from chugging along. That's the reality. Pain and pleasure. And we find ourselves at one end of this sticky stick or the other or somewhere in between. And so what do we try to do? We try to head towards the pleasure as much as we can and be in avoidance of the pain. And that seems to be our lot. It doesn't matter how much you know about this world, you can't never change that. Whether you go away from society into the wilderness and you build yourself a log cabin, you're still going to encounter suffering because that's the nature of the human being. 
And so it doesn't matter how far you run, you can never hide. And so it comes back to a level of acceptance then, doesn't it? Accepting that we're here for whatever reason, whether we chose it or just by chance, anything, anybody's speculation again, anybody's opinion again. What do I know about it? I don't know any more than the next man that's looked into a few of the options. So what do I do? I just look around me and they go, well, okay. It is what it is. What am I gonna do with it? Well, I like that over there. I don't like that over there. So I'm gonna head for that over there. And I'm gonna try to spend as much time in that over there, which is more conducive to my equanimity. And so then, by summary then, what are we doing? What do we want? I'm, I don't think we want truth, people. We want equanimity. If somebody said to us, do you want lifelong equanimity or do you want to know the truth? And you said, I want to know the truth. Well, if you want to know the truth, you wouldn't have equanimity. You wouldn't have this deep peace within your mind and body because it isn't possible to carry the weight of all that stuff. It's so immensely mind-bogglingly crazy. How could you be settled with that? And so, why not just opt for ignorance, really? In between. You don't want to be completely ignorant because then there's so many things that will befall you that's not going to be of benefit to you, which you could have avoided with a little bit of wisdom. So you want to be somewhere in between. Because the knowledge that you can acquire as you go deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole, it becomes so bizarre and it's not of this world. It pertains to this world somehow, but it's not of this world. It's outside this dimension. All the stuff the gurus talk about and the esoteric writings and scriptures, the Nag Ahmadi, these scrolls that were found in a cave in Egypt, 1945, talk about the Archons, this negative energy which has dominion over this world. And so whether you call it Archon, whether you call it Jehovah, whether you call it Demiurge, negative energy, that's what it is. And that's what has dominion. And that seems to have been in place for at least 2,000 years. And so when people are looking to change stuff that's going on, chemtrails, G-grid, the splicing of the human being with nanotechnology and all this sort of thing, can we really ever hope to change any of that? After all, look how many of us there are it's just a handful, isn't it? There's a minuscule handful of us that know a little bit about what's going on. And you can see that as soon as I say something about a psychedelic that can waken you up, then my sights close down. As soon as I mention like um, the Muslims or you know Jews or something like that, my sights close down. And, and so this just brings about a certain reality of how minuscule we are and how our power is also. And unless we collectivize and group together, which we can't do because there's only a handful of us spread all over the world, very difficult to make any impact. So what do we do? What avenues have we got? The avenues that they allow us to use momentarily. That is rapidly changing and probably within less than five years, there won't be any sites like mine around anymore that encourage critical thinking, encourage people to look closely at what's going on and not believe a single thing. They want you to believe exactly what they laid down for you to believe, just like they did 2,000 years ago with the Ten Commandments. 
They told us, that's all you need to know. And if you step outside that, we'll smite you. What's changed, people? Nothing. Nothing at all. So anyway, I've, um, I've had a change of disposition, haven't I? And this is what I say in relation to be careful whom you speak with, what you read, what you watch, what you listen to, because there's energy pertaining to words. There's actual entities pertaining to words. And when you are in communion with these words, you are in communion with these entities. And I now am carrying a certain weight, but because I'm a wizard of a sort, I can eliminate that as soon as I want to. And within a, within a few minutes, I can eradicate all of those thoughts from my mind and I can return to the bliss. And on an ongoing basis throughout the day, I will say I don't want to engage with that particular energy and I won't. And so this is why I switch from this side and I switch from that side and I switch from another side. Because to be engaged in one particular energy, I don't think is of any great benefit. Even if you engaged in the bliss all the time, because when you engaged in the bliss, you don't want anything to do with the matrix. But the fact is, we are in the matrix. We are a part of the matrix. The matrix is a part of us. It's inescapable. So therefore, we cannot dwell like the Buddha under a tree or like some of these Indian gurus walking around in the nappies all their lives. You know, with their wooden bowl, which gets filled from time to time, with a bit of rice and sauce. We can't live like that. We've got stuff to do, stuff to partake in, pressures, money, paper to chase, and all the rest of it. And so therefore then, this is why, one of the reasons I guess, that uh, I am like I am. Just keep sampling the various vibrations and fruits of this life and dwelling within them until it no longer becomes conducive to me to do so. And I can't get how people like Ike I've banged on about the same thing for 30 years. I couldn't do it, really. I need a whole lot more diversity in my life. I need to sample more fruits. And so this is why then my channel is like it is. And you will never know what you're gonna get from one day to the next. There they have it, people. Hmm. So, I'm calm, I don't have anything to do. I can choose, play my guitar, go to the gym, walk in the woods, walk on the beach, meditate, listen to some more YouTube, nah, can't be bothered. Generally save that for a few hours in the evening time. So I can just look at the clouds, and I can just sit here for an hour and just look at the clouds and observe how am I feeling? I'm feeling very calm, really calm. And it's beautiful. I think that's the secret, to find the calm, to find you, your true essence of stillness. And then when you have this stillness, and my stillness is with me on an ongoing basis, I can appear to be agitated, and I can stop booming, I can stop ranting, and then people think, he's angry, oh, he does not meditate and he's angry. After I've made my point, after I've delivered my theatrics, I'm as calm as a cucumber, 
cool as a cucumber. See? Turn it on, turn it off. So, I use these emotions. And if you can do that, then it's a beautiful thing. Because you're in control, rather than the emotions using you, feeding on you. You turn on whatever it is that you feel is necessary to aid you in achieving whatever it is that you are desirous to achieve. We need certain energies, don't we? And so if you're going to be climbing a mountain, you need pure determination and grit. And you grit your teeth and you do it. And you override the pain and the exhaustion and all that. And then if you want to engage with somebody lightheartedly, then you're just free and you're jovial and you have this demeanour about you. And then if you want to get into a serious debate, then you have a certain seriousness about you. Yeah? And so try playing a little bit more with certain emotions. Just create them in an instant and then drop them in another. Instead of being manipulated by whomever it is that you're engaging with. That's the thing. I can do it. And I'm affected by it, you know, in a similar way to, to everybody else. If I watch something, all of a sudden I can get, right, I'm gonna make a video about this, and ah, 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 ah. But then, like I say, as soon as the, 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 my video is done, as soon as my part in my movie, as far as you're concerned, is over, then I'm sitting here like this. <laughs> Whatever. I'm only talking, aren't I? Just part of my day. Talking. Hello? Anyone to talk to? Anyone to talk to?